Okay, uh, my name is Omar Soriano, and we are going to be discussing. Um, we're going to be discussing something I'm calling Melodies Simplified. Three principles for a shape approach to playing a Janko keyboard. So our outline for today is: I'm going to take a minute to discuss the Janko melody problem. What's the problem? What's the trouble with playing melodies on a Janko layout keyboard? Then I'm going to lay out three principles for the approach I've developed. I don't know if it's a final solution. It's something I've been working on for about six or seven months. But it's three principles that I've worked out over the last few months that rely on shapes that, for me so far, has vastly simplified the problem of working my way through melodies. And finally, I'm going to walk through uh, a traditional song, a great American songbook piece called Perdido, which may be familiar to some of you, by way of playing it with basic shapes. Okay, so let's talk about the problem itself. The problem with playing melodies on a Janko style keyboard. Because of there's only five, there's five or six rows on a Janko keyboard, specifically the fact that each key is repeated three times or sometimes two times, a certain confusion arises as to which way to play the, se the sequence of notes. So for example, if you have a melody um, that goes, you know, should you play all those notes in a row? Should you seesaw up and down? Should you maybe start low or go high and then end low? There's a bit of confusion there. So there's literally po literally dozens of possible ways to play a pre-existing melody. And that presents a problem for us as a Janko community that we are going to have to find a solution for uh, as we are growing in the world taking this instrument seriously. So the desired solution, and I say the desired solution um, because sometimes you don't know what the solution is, but you know what the solution should look like. So the desired solution is going to a, it's going to utilize patterns already familiar to the player. In other words, if the player already knows how to play a shape that looks like this, um, when it comes time to play a song, do we really want, you know, the player to be playing, you know, you know, if they've already got a style, if they've already got a shape that they've got in their muscle memory, why not just go ahead and use that as opposed to something that's unfamiliar? that's going to slow down the amount of time it's going to take to learn something. So the second desired, the second aspect of a desired solution would be that it would give the player some kind of mnemonic advantage for memorizing the tune. Right? So a melody that looks like this, you're instantly going to think, okay, I'm going to play those three whole notes in a line, is probably going to be easier to memorize than a line that looks, you know, maybe like this you know, or, uh, you know, whatever, and, and you'll imagine the most arbitrary thing you could play on the keyboard is going to be harder to memorize than something that's orderly, neat, and fits into a recognizable shape. And the third thing is uh, we want the, the shapes to be comfortable for the player. Now, I've been very vocal in the past about ergonomics and comfort not being the utmost consideration in Janko keyboard playing. It is a priority. For me personally, it's not the priority. For me, the highest, most important thing going on uh, in a Janko keyboard is isomorphism. That is, that same shapes give us same sounds. Um, however, insofar as it's possible, we want to choose a more comfortable fingering shape um, as opposed to a less comfortable fingering or shape. Okay, so that's the problem. So here's the solution I've been working out. Solution is probably a strong word. Uh, let's say this is the approach I've been working out the last few months. Uh, I've specifically held back on creating this video because I wanted to use it myself for about six or seven months, try it on for size uh, before I, I shared it you know, with the world. And I want to see if it worked for me personally. Okay, so here are three principles of a shape approach to playing a Janko keyboard. First principle. On a Janko layout piano, a great deal of music can be made with about a dozen shapes. Now, that, that, that's not, we're not talking about technique yet. We're talking about an overarching philosophical principle. 
you can create a lot of music on this board with relatively few shapes because the shapes are so reusable. So for example, uh, this shape here, which I'm going to introduce you to in a few minutes, which I call the bird shape, has a lot of different uses. So in this case, uh, my most frequent use for this shape is to use it as a voice, a rootless voicing for a C major seven chord. So here, uh, I've got a major seven, here's a ninth, here's a third, here's a fifth. All right, so that's one usage for that shape. However, if I place it starting on the six, six, one, nine, four, now I've got a, a C6 with a fourth suspension in there. So one, one shape, multiple uses. So one of the goals of this approach to Janko keyboard playing is we want to get as much mileage out of possible out of any one shape. Find a shape that works for you and then over time look for more and more uses of that same shape. Try to get as much music as you can out of that same shape. Okay, second principle. The goal in general is to make music with fewer shapes. When in doubt, use a familiar shape instead of an unfamiliar shape. This is almost the first one stated uh, just in a different way. So if I'm working my way through a song and uh, this is one of my shapes and I've got a melody that goes like this, instead of using this shape, and there's nothing wrong with this shape, but if this isn't one of my shapes that I've internalized and play a lot, played a lot over time, why would I choose to use this shape when playing a melody when I've got this shape already under my belt? You know, so when in doubt, go with the shape that you've already had under your belt. You're gonna see, you're gonna see learning go a lot faster that way. And the third principle of a shape approach to playing is group sequences of serial notes into manageable groups. Then memorize the shapes, not the individual notes. So this, this, this is probably the most important thing going on here on this page. Memorize shapes, not notes. Now, we do that in other parts of music all the time. All the time. If you were explaining to somebody how to play uh, Autumn Leaves, now I'm going to switch gears here and talk about chords as opposed to melody, because we do this all the time with chords. We group things into, into groups. So, if you were to explain to somebody how you play Autumn Leaves, you wouldn't say, well, I start off with a B flat, then a D, an E flat, and then a G, and then I move to uh, an A, C, an E flat, and a G, and then I finally take it to an A, C, D, F. That's how I play Autumn Leaves. We don't talk that way. We organize notes into groups. We say, I play a C minor 7, I take it to an F dominant 7, and then I resolve on a B flat major seven. Not only do we do that, but those of us who are, are a little bit more meta in our thinking, we might just say, I open up, st stand, uh, I open up autumn leaves with a standard cadence. We've gotten to the point where we give names to m a movement of chords because it's so much easier to remember one concept for a, a group of data, a group of information, than it is to remember individual data points. So what we're doing here with this approach to shape playing melody is we're taking the same thinking that we've been using for chords, the same thinking that we've been using for chord progressions, and now we're going to apply it to no individual notes, to melodies. Okay? So uh, that's the concept. That's the philosophy. When I'm learning a song, I like to memorize the head, the melody of the song. So I'll usually acquire the sheet music for the song, and because I'm not a particularly great sight reader, I'll take a green pen and I'll circle or I'll draw squares around groups of notes that I think can be grouped together into shapes. Now, you can't see this on the page here. So for the purpose of this video, what I've done is I've drawn up a few diagrams that are easy to pick up on the camera. So the first three notes of Perdido go like this. Okay. Now, there's any number of ways we can shape that or finger that, right? And that's the problem. 
because it can go like this, it can go like this, it can go like this, and we're only up to the first three notes of the song. I mean, that can be frustrating. Which way do we do it? Which pathway do we take? Well, when in doubt, use a familiar shape instead of a fam instead of an unfamiliar shape. So I suppose you could you could look here and say, well, that looks a little bit familiar. Maybe that looks familiar. For me, this instantly, maybe not instantly, well, instantly now because I'm getting experience at doing this, but to me that looks like a, a shape that I play very frequently, which I call the bird. Right, because to me it looks like a bird. Here's one wing, and here's another wing. Okay? Now, I use that shape all the time, especially in chords. That's how I choose to finger... All oh, right, that's how I choose to shape my major seven chords. That shape is also useful because if I start on the sixth degree, I'm playing a C6 with a suspended fourth. In other words, that shape, this shape comes up all the time in my playing. So what I'm going to note down on my sheet music is I'm going to note the, the note that's at the very beginning, the one that I build off of, C, E flat, F. And even though I don't play this note right away in this melody, I'm gonna, that's part of my shape that I'm used to seeing, right? So when I go to play Perdido, I don't think so much in terms of C, E flat, F. I think in terms of, oh, I'm gonna play Bird starting from C. I might even throw in this extra note here, even though it's not part of the melody. Okay? Okay, so one, three notes down, right? So the melody goes... Okay, now we move to another set of notes. We've got... Or it could be... Or it could be... We've got these options, right? So what we're doing is we're going to start look for, looking for a familiar shape that has, that contains those three notes. So we could do, I've got a shape that goes like this. I've got another shape, I guess, that goes like this. All right, but the simplest shape, for me at least, is that good old shape that makes us a triad. You know, that's how we make a, a C major triad. I call that shape the hustler, just because to me, it looks like somebody playing billiards, right? This is the head, this is their one arm, and then this is their other hand that's controlling the billiard stick, right? That would be the billiard stick. That looks like a billiards player to me. So I call that the hustler. It reminds me of Paul Newman, right? At the billiards table. All right. So the melody calls for... All right. So I'm going to play it. Let's play it all together. We've got... Perdido. Right? Do you see what's happening here? There we are, we're, we're through the first five or six bars of the song, and we've done it with only two shapes. We've got the bird shape, and we've got the hustler shape. Right, right there we've gone to the first six bars of the song. This song is pretty simple. It's the kind of song you'd want to start off with. Uh, if you're going to be learning the shape approach. Okay, so let's continue. So let's say we've got up to here. Right. After we do this that, that second time around, the melody calls for... Right. Or it could be... So this is where we get that confusion, right? Oh, man, should I be playing this one up here or this one or this one? Okay, what I'm going to suggest is once you get here, go up to here and play an octave. Now, I play the octave on the second row. Uh, I'm trying to re... I'm going to reteach myself pretty soon to play it up here as well. So however you play an octave, go ahead and play that octave, right? So we've got... And the next melody note is here. So we can either play it here, or we could play it here, All right, from the very top. Okay, 
So far we're, we're through almost the entire A section and we've used up three shapes. Right. Last part of that melody goes. So where do we play this? We could play it here, or we could play it, you know, here. Well, to me, when I see these three notes in that kind of shape, I'm thinking, hey, look, that looks like bird again, right? Except instead of building bird from C, this looks like bird built from D. So I'm not even going to create a new page for that. In my mind, I'm just going to file it as that's another bird, right? Okay. And then this is very last sequence of notes, right? Which goes. Should we should we shape it that way? Should we shape it like this? Should we shape it like this? Right. I've got a shape for this, right? Uh, here it is. Which I call a broken wing, which is almost exactly like the bird, except it looks like this little wing here is kind of broken in. Like if you're a bird and your wing is broken. That's what you would look like, right? So, so I'm going to play those three notes. This, see that shape there? Looks just like a bird. Looks just like a bird, except the wing is broken. So that's what I'm going to call it. I'm going to call that a broken wing. Okay, so I've just gotten through the first eight bars of Perdido. Uh, and also the first 16 bars because the next eight are just about a repetition. So let's do the whole first 16 bars of Perdido, right? Sixteen bars of a great American songbook piece with one, two, three, four shapes. Not bad. Not bad. This this should be something inside of you should be saying this is a much easier way to learn melodies. Take some time with the sheet music or write out the melody notes and then group them into easy to memorize shapes instead of trying to memorize the individual notes. Now, a question somebody might be having is, well, I know that the shape goes like this, but how do I know what order to play them in? How do I know Perdido doesn't go like this? The answer is twofold. The first answer is as your ear starts to develop, once you've narrowed down that that part of the melody is existing in a shape and there's only four notes in that shape, I'm not saying it should be obvious, but as your ear starts to develop, it's not that hard to figure out, oh, the melody goes like this. It starts low and then it goes up a little higher. Or maybe it goes like this. Okay, so as your ear develops, it's not like we've got, you know, 300 keys that, that, that the melody could be arising from. We've narrowed it down to its these four notes and we just got to get them in the right order because that's the shape. The second half of that two-part answer is, and it's really a big advantage of this shape approach to playing, is... Once you've got the shape right, you're going to find that if you don't pl quite play the notes in the right order, or you play the, 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 the wrong note, it doesn't sound that bad. I mean, if I play Perdido like this, right, I played it like this, and instead of playing this, I play it like this, it doesn't sound that bad. It sounds like I'm just improvising, having fun with the melody. Right? And you, you're, it sounds like you're messing with the melody, which is a big part of what jazz is about anyway. anyway. Okay, so we've gotten through the A section of Perdido. Now we get to that chorus, right, that goes, or I should say the bridge, the B section. Right? Now we could play that, you know. You know, there's lots of different ways we can shape that. Having messed with this song a bit, the shape that most seems to just fit over my fingers, because I've played it a lot of times, is this shape, which I've learned to call the Heisman.
Now to me, this looks like a man holding a football with his shoulder sticking out his hand in the good old Heisman Trophy pose. So I've dubbed this shape Heisman. Right? And this is a super useful shape. This comes up in chords all the time. It's how we it's how we shape the minor seventh chords, right? It's how it's one of the ways I shape that rootless minor seventh chords. So that shape comes up all the time. And in this case it's the melody. Right? So we got now you gotta understand when we're talking about these shapes, we're not being dogmatic about these shapes. And by that I mean we don't have to rigidly play it like this. There's latitude, there's room to move. I can move my thumb here. You know, with these three notes I can go. Right, so the shape is just that. It's it's a, a rough estimate of the position I want my hand to be in to properly hit those notes. So I'm gonna say Right? And while I'm still in the Heisman shape, I'm going to go like this. Right? Because this is sort of part of my fudging of playing the Heisman shape. Okay? So, boom, we've just played the four bars of the B section. Now, what's beautiful about a song like Beredido is because it uses the chord sequence of the rhythm bridge, which goes like this. As a matter of fact, look, I'm playing the same exact shape in my left hand, right? There's that Heisman shape. That's four bars, right? It goes A minor 7, D7, D minor 7, G7. But then the second half, bars 5 through 8 of the rhythm bridge, do the same exact thing except a whole note down. So same shapes. I'm not even getting into chords. Don't pay attention to the chords I'm playing. I'm just about to make a point, though. Right? G minor 7, C7, C minor 7, F7. The point is, the first half of the bridge, the first four bars, are the same as the second half of the bridge, except play the whole note down. Now, what a lot of composers will do when they're writing a melody for a bridge like that is they'll take the melody line and they'll go... And then they'll do the same exact thing for the second half, except a whole note down. Except instead of going, it goes here. So the whole eight bars goes like this. Same thing except going down, starting from here. Get it? And the whole time my hand is in this Heisman shape. <laughs> you see, actually, that's a, that's a good teachable moment right there. Do you see how I hit the wrong note there? I said like this, and then I went like this. That was a mistake I made. Instead of going this to here, I went here to here. But because it's part of the same shape, one of the ways you know that you've chosen the correct shape is if you hit a note that's on the melody, but it's in the shape, it sounds okay. All right, so I, I like that. That sounded nice. Right? I'm fudging it to show you if you play the right notes and if you play the wrong notes in the right shape, you'll probably get a good sound. So there we are. We got through the entire B section, the whole eight bars, primarily relying on one shape, this Heisman shape. And once you get back to the A section, it's repeating itself again. So there we go. We've got one 32 bar jazz song that we've learned to play the melody on with just five shapes. I mean, that's incredible. Now, I got through this really fast because I've been doing this for six months. You know, when I first sat down with a new song, uh, it would take me 60, I don't know, 90 minutes to work out how to shape my way through the melody. And now I'm down to doing it in 10 or 15 minutes. So all together, let's listen to the whole melody, just the right hand, not the left, played in the shapes that you now know.
There you go. A shape approach to playing melody on a Django piano.